Well, thank you, Thomas, for the invitation here. And I'm so excited that I can uh, uh, turn the three years of research I embarked since 2012 into uh, an occasion to share my understanding of the large systems, which I think act as an operating system of society. So some of you are programmers, and you probably know that if you're writing a code on a faulty operating system, that can get really, really frustrating. And so we are here to change, and in order to change, we need to understand how things work. So I'll be talking about the economic system, and it has a name, it's capitalism. So I will invite you to think about beyond capitalism. If we want to build a better system that takes care of the economy as a whole, it's a compassionate economy, it's an economy that is, does not wreck our planet, how will we build that? And so the approach we're going to take today is to understand the design features that makes capitalism so dangerous to communities, to equity, to fairness, and to the natural environment. And then, based on that, we can think about, okay, how do we build a different economic system that does not have those design flaws? And so we're going to talk about big ideas. And for that, I want to uh, quote Lincoln, President Lincoln, in uh, the second annual meeting of Congress. He said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we should save our country. I would say we should save our planet. And the planet doesn't need saving, as people mention, but we do, <laughs> because if the planet no longer supports uh, you know, advanced forms of life, we're in trouble. So we will not shy away from new ideas, and let's just jump in. And I would actually, here is the, the ambitious agenda, and then we'll see if you guys want to do a more interactive presentation. Uh, what I've done in the past is I've broken down and let you guys talk among each other about the topics just before I introduce them. So if you're open to that, we can introduce a little bit of interactivity that could be fun and break down the presentation a little bit. But I'll start with the vision for the new economy. Where do we want to go? What is the, you know, the image of uh, what we could achieve once we make this great turning that we're all involved in? Uh, I'll then talk about the, econo the economy in its historical context. Then we'll talk about growth. There's a lot of talks about we need to grow the economy, right? Uh, but then there's the other thought, well, we live in a finite planet, so you can't grow something forever until you hit the limits of uh, a limited biosphere. So we'll talk about growth. Is it good? Is it bad? What type of growth? Who benefits from it? And then we'll take a little step back and say, okay, what is the economy for, really? And I think we we'll, can then think about um, rethinking about what the economy is for. Right now, it seems like the society is at the service of the economy and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Then we'll look at the structural design flaws of the current economic system, and this will guide our thinking in terms of the new system we can build. And then it's up to you guys to figure out and imagine. I don't have all the solutions. I am just providing a framework for you guys to discuss and uh, think about what the new system will look like. So let me start with the, the end goal. You can summarize the problem with the current economic system by this picture. There are a few decision makers that make economic decisions that impact a lot of people, a lot of communities, a lot of workers, a lot of ecosystems. And these people do not have any say, most of the time, on what decisions are made up here. Think about you know, the shareholders or the board of directors of large corporations, right? Whether Walmart moves here and destroys all the local retailers is not a decision made by the people that are suffering the consequences of that decision. And I think at the end of the day, we need to move towards economic democracy. We need to move to a place where 
if communities, if workers, if ecosystems are impacted by economic decisions, they should be at the table. And this is easier said than done, and we'll see what the challenges are, but that's what we need to keep in mind. If economic decisions impact us, our families, our health, the health of our ecosystem, we should be at the table and make those decisions together. So, let's look at the economy in its historical context. This is a, um, a chart that I got from Richard Wolf, a great guy that has a, a weekly um, economics update, and shows the real wages per hour uh, in the United States from 19, 1890 to 1980. And this has been the miracle of capitalism in this country, which is, you know, the real wage is basically what you can actually buy, is adjusted for inflation, and it's basically how many things you can buy with what you earn. And what you see here is the amazing economic engine that capitalism has been in this country, uh, where the standard of living of Americans have gone up every single decade. And this is what has drawn people from Europe to come here for opportunities and so on. This is really an amazing feat of capitalism in, you know, 150 years run. Now, this was possible. Why? Because workers have become more and more productive over that period of time. So for every hour, uh, you know, the, the blue line is basically the hourly wage. And the red line is what those people produced in an hour. And this increase in productivity has been really spectacular, mostly due to education and to technology. And you can see that both have kind of grown together over this period of time, but something happened after 1980. This is what happened. Those two lines diverged. The productivity of labor has increased, in fact, increased exponentially. But what the workers received in real terms has not changed at all. And this big uh, discrepancy here is basically corporate profits. Because corporations have been able to pay a flat real wage and getting more and more from the workers. Now, I want you to look at two periods of time. This, I think, is 1949 to uh, 1947 to 1979 is that first period there when the two lines grew kind of together. So wages were going up, productivity was also going up. And then look at this period from 1979 to 2006. In the first period, this is the change in real family income in the United States over that period of time. Now, it's divided by quintile. So imagine lining all the families up by their income and divided them in five buckets containing the same number of families. So the first quintile are the poorest people. And then the second quintile is the second, and so on. And what you see here that, um, you know, that's one, two, three, four, five. Over that period of time, the standard of living of all Americans rose and roughly doubled. So this was shared prosperity. The rich were still at the top of the game, and they double their lavish lifestyle, but so did the people that were uh, making a little bit less. They also experienced a doubling of their last lifestyle. And if anything, this is the last bar is the top 5% didn't get as much, but you know, they were doing just fine, thank you very much, when they started. <laughs> so they didn't really suffer. This what happened in the period from 1979 to 2006. This is a generation. And what happened is that the standard of living of the bottom 80% of the people barely moved. Most of the growth in income uh, accrued to the top 20%, and then if you break it down to the top 10%, they double the standard of living, the top 5%, 143% up, the top 1% more than tripled its standard of living. And we've seen basically this trend continue. So 
What brought that about? It was a number of things, but for example, it was the taxation system. In, uh, I believe, 1941, uh, FDR went to Congress and said we should have a maximum income. Nobody should be allowed to, do, to earn more than $25,000 a year, right? which is $350,000 in today's dollars. Congress flipped out, so they reached an agreement, and the tax rate for the top bracket for the people making more than $350,000 of today's dollar was 94%, right? That was in 1942. So, you know, the economy grew a lot over that period of time. That's kind of the, the first uh, section here. The taxes on the top bracket were above 90%. And the rich people didn't do bad, right? In spite of those taxes, they also double the standard of living. It's just a way of, you know, sharing the prosperity among all the segments of society. But of course, uh, people that are powerful and have a lot of influence, we're able to change the taxation system so the income came down, is now about 39% for the top bracket, and uh, capital gains came down, corporate taxes came down. So this is just one of the mechanisms by which the distribution of the wealth that was created by everybody. Because, you know, um, when people say the, the very rich people are the job creators, that's not really true, because if you don't have customers, you're not going to hire new people if you know you cannot sell more goods. The job creators are the people that are providing the aggregate demand that allows you to expand and to hire, right? And so as we concentrate more wealth to the top, since it's mostly not consumed and it's saved away or you know, moved to tax shelters uh, abroad, the economy suffers as a whole. So uh, let's talk about the economic growth. You know, there's a little, you know, is, is it desirable? What type? And I would say just for the fun of it, I would invite you to turn around maybe and have a little discussion among yourself about this topic, and then we'll, we'll tackle it. So I'll give you five minutes to share with your neighbor your thought about growth. Is it, is it needed? What type of growth? Right? Are you open for that? Yeah? So that we break the monotony? I'll give you five minutes to chat with your neighbor about that. So I think that was fun. Let's talk about growth. And here is the um, amazing thing. We don't have an economic problem in this country. Even though we are not utilizing 20% of our productive capacity, even though we have millions of people that are unemployed or underemployed, our economy right now is producing $200,000 of GDP per family of four. This is an unbelievably productive economy already, even though it's not at full capacity. We don't have an economic problem, we have a distribution problem. So you need to keep that in mind when people are saying we need to grow the economy to resolve our problem. No, we already generate enough wealth uh, to support the entire population if we do it right. The problem is that all the wealth now is concentrated in the hands of the few. The other thing is when they say, well, it doesn't matter if there is a big difference in income and wealth as long as everybody is doing better, and they are implying that growth will lift, lift all the boats. But we've actually seen from the charts that growth has actually increased, not decreased, right, with growth. This period of time from 1979 to 2006, the economy grew a lot, in more than double in size. But the richer got richer, and the poorer, you know, relatively speaking, they got poorer. So, you know, growth enough is not a guarantee of um, you know, equity or shared uh, prosperity. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that, uh, and I have a chart of this, almost all the benefits of 
economic growth now are captured by the top 1%. The other thing to uh, think about, and this is a study that I will go into a little bit more uh, next week, is that, um, as you know, the markets do not see what nature provides for free, right? It's like we breathe the air, we're not charged by nature for that service. We uh, draw water from the wells or from the rivers, we're not charged for that. You know, we take wood from the forest, we we're not charged for that. So the market does not see what nature provides for free. And so there has been an attempt to quantify what we get from nature for free in monetary terms. And in 2009, which is when we had all the, the data available, it turned out that on a planetary level, we were using $7.3 trillion of unpriced natural capital to generate our $60 trillion worth of economic activity worldwide. In other words, nature has been subsidizing our economic activity and our economic growth. So part of that economic growth is predicated on the destruction of natural capital on which we depend for our long-term survival. So those are all things we need to keep in mind when we talk about growth. But specifically, this is an amazing uh, chart that was um, based on work done by Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez. Saez is actually in Berkeley. And what they did is they basically looked at the periods when the economy expanded. You know, we go through periods when the economy expands, and then there is a recession, then the economy expands again. And the question they asked is, how much of that expansion, which usually translates into national income, went to the top 1%, and how much of that went to the bottom 99%? And so in uh, the expansion from 1949 to 1953, that was immediately after the war, you know, when taxes were really high, it basically went 99% to the 99% and 1% to the 1%. That was kind of fair. And then, you know, 5% to the 1%, 95 to the rest, 8, 9, you see those numbers? And then in, in the late 70s, when we had the economic expansion from 75 to 79, 25% of the income went to the 1% and 75 to the bottom 99. Well, from 2009 to 2012, supposedly we had an economic expansion. Not great, but the economy has been growing since 2009. And 95% of all that growth has accrued to the income of the top 1% of the population. And everybody else was basically fighting for little scraps. So again, when we talk about we need to grow the economy, you'll hear politicians say that and so on. Keep in mind that if you don't fix the way that wealth and that growth is then distributed among the population, you're not really solving anyone's problem, except maybe the problem of the 1%. And actually, the 1% might be you know, having too much money and not knowing what to do with that. So it might, you, know, you might com be compounding that problem as well. Uh, and of course, this is uh, um, somebody else said, OK, what if we look at the top 10% in, in instead of the top 1%? And what you see now is that the bottom 90% saw its real income decline during the last economic expansion. So the top 10% is mining even the poor. <laughs> so it's taking all the advantages of economic growth and extracting more from the people that are uh, in the bottom 90%. So this is what we need to keep in mind when we're talking about growth. A, we really don't need to grow to make uh, the society at large well off. We really need to find a better way of sharing the benefits of growth that is really created by everybody. It's created by the people buying the services, people doing their uh, you know, blue collar, white collar jobs, and so on. And again, the <clears throat> this is the study I will talk more about next time. But I would say, why don't we stop a little bit back and say, what is the economy for? Really? Why do we have an economy in the first place? And, you know, if you look at um, the term, economy is the same root as ecology. Well, ecology and economy have the same root and comes from Greek, oikos, which means the house, the household, and the family. So 
ecology is the study of the house. The, you know, you could think of it the study of where we live, right? The planet. And economy is management of the house. So what is economics? And what is economics for? If you look at uh, standard textbook uh, definitions, it says economics is the study of the allocation of limited and or scarce resources among alternative competing ends. And even the language makes you a little bit uncomfortable. First, because there is this frame of insufficiency and scarcity, and that there needs to be a competition to get to the little thing we have. Right, so even the definition of economy makes you already operate in a frame of mind that might not really be real. And I have a plot in a community garden, and when the tomatoes or the zucchinis come, I tell you we're not talking about scarcity. I mean, there are the birds that are feeding, I have too much on my own, I have to give it to the neighbors. Sometimes the neighbors want to see me coming down with zucchinis, they're trying to avoid me or pretend they don't know me or, you know, put some disgust is on so that they are not settled with additional zucchini. So in reality, if you look at nature, abundance is a better metaphor than scarcity. Uh, so what is the economy for? You could think about organizing input procurement, production and distribution of goods and services to improve human quality of life and well-being. So in other words, we engage with each other in trade and share the results of our labor because we want to improve our well-being, right? I mean, that's basically why we engage in this. And so at the end of the day, we're doing it to meet our fundamental needs. So what are those needs? Maybe that's a good place to start. Well, we know we have physiological needs, right? We need clean air, clean water, I'm sure I'm a fan of clean air and clean water, and I bet you're too, right? Because we need that to survive. We need nourishing food and we need sleep. But then we also need safety, we need health, we need belonging, and then there are other things like meaningful participation and a sense of contribution to society, self-actualization and expression, and so on. These are considered kind of the Maslow, um, you know, list of essential needs. So, in order to, to meet those basic fundamental human needs, we need the services that nature provides. Because clean water and clean air, it's really provided by nature, the trees, then the plankton in the sea, and so on. So we need oxygen production and regulation, we need soil fertility, we need water purification, usually happens in the ground with the microorganisms or when water you know, cycles through forests, nutrient recycling, climate regulation, crop pollination, disease control. I mean, there are a lot of services that na nature provides for free to us, which are necessary for the satisfaction of our basic fundamental needs. So maybe we can think of the economy as having this goal. Meeting fundamental human needs of everyone in society while preserving the integrity of ecosystems on whose health our own survival and that of future generations depends. So if you have a referendum and say, what do you guys think about this idea of the economy? I bet a lot of people say, yeah, that makes sense, right? We want to preserve the ecosystems on which our survival depends and want to meet everybody's basic needs. Who shall we leave out and why? Right? Because at the end of the day, uh, the way we set up the economy is really based on the way we set up laws and regulations and, and agreements, uh, right? So uh, one example was the tax rates. You know, you change the tax rates, you change the way you distribute wealth. It's just, it's not a, a law of nature that says that some people need to get everything and everybody else has to, you know, fight for the scraps. Is a social contract, is a series of rules that we can change is you know, a set of policies that we can transform and redesign. So, if you keep this in mind, right, that the economy is for meeting fundamental human needs of everyone in society while preserving the integrity of ecosystems on whose health our own survival and that of future generation depends, you find out our current system falls short. <laughs> right? 
So let's look at the structural design features of capitalism that makes it incompatible with this goal. What are they? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm not the only one that is saying, even though I come from Berkeley, so you would maybe expect that someone coming from Berkeley would say, capitalism is not working. But don't take it from me, take it from Klaus Schwab, which is the founder of the World Economic Forum, which is the yearly powwow of the richest capitalists in the world that get together and discuss big things and big ideas. He opened the 2012 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland with this line, capitalism in its current form no longer fits the world around us. This is one of the major capitalists. So it's not just the crazy guy from Berkeley saying this. So let's look at what are the features of capitalism that make it not fit the world we live in. And I would say, if you look at uh, the history of economic systems, obviously what we had um, before uh, capitalism, we have feudalism. And if you just compare feudalism with, and I'm not saying we need to go back to feudalism, but it's just a different economic system. And the differences between feudalism and capitalism, for example, make clear some key uh, design differences. Commodification of nature and labor is really at the root of capitalism. Uh, during the feudalism, uh, even the feudal lords did not own the land and they couldn't really sell it. It was understood that it belonged to God and the feudal lords were managing it. So you couldn't sell the land. But at a certain point, we had enclosures, and then people started selling you know, pieces of land created not by man, but by nature, God, whatever, you know, non-human forces over millennia, right? Uh, and the commodification of labor is actually a very important one. Now we buy and sell labor as if it were a commodity. What happens when the productivity of that labor experiences a rapid increase, you need fewer people to do the same jobs. So as labor productivity improves, you don't need that many people. Because whatever you have is so productive. So in other words, when people say, we need to improve productivity, the productivity is the, at the engine of the economy, if you are at the same time treating labor as a commodity, that commodity will be devalued every time productivity improves. So if you look at a phone and you look at zero, and under zero, there's a little word called oper, for operator, right? We used to have a little person there that would connect you with your grandma by changing, right, technology got rid of that, we're now much more efficient, but now we need fewer people. And so if you're treating labor as a commodity, then labor productivity becomes a problem because then we are obsolete. Not that many of us are needed anymore to do the jobs at hand. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the fundamental human needs are denied based on affordability. You cannot afford food, Sorry, you are one of the 47 million Americans that are food insecure. You cannot afford a house over your roof. Sorry, you're going to be homeless. You cannot afford health care. You're going to die. I mean, the basic needs of society are now um, distributed through the mechanism of the market and only if you can afford. So we need to think about a system that actually provides the fundamental needs to everybody, not only to those that can afford it. We also see how much more of the wealth and the income is going to go to you know, the top uh, percentage of the population, which means they will be able to you know, address their fundamental needs and everybody else will be struggling more and more to do so. So the other one is there is a trend towards larger economic entities. This was observed by uh, Adam Smith, uh, this was observed by Karl Marx. This was observed by just about every economic um, uh, researcher and, and thinker if, over the last 300 years. That's a natural tendency. You know why? Because 
Pure competition is really hard if you are a business. You would be in a much better position if you are one of the two or three that controls the market, or even better if you are a monopolist. So there is a natural tendency of businesses to gobble up you know, weaker ones and smaller ones, eliminate the competition by acquiring it. And I have just a couple of, and of course with that, concentration of economic power, there is loss of competition, which is you know, the, the, uh, the key idea of let the market work, the invisible hand that would bring happiness if everybody pursued their thing. It's predicated on a, a very robust competition among economic agents with the same economic power. Because if you have some big players, then the competition goes out of the window. And look at cable companies' consolidation. Look at the defense industry consolidation. Look at the banking system consolidation. I mean, you see the trend, and this is like across all industries. And this is intrinsic of capitalism, is this tendency towards larger and larger economic entities that eliminate competition and then have the power to, you know, to capture the regulatory uh, process or to buy their own government. I saw this little um, beautiful um, bumper sticker saying, invest in America, buy a congressman. <laughs> So we'll, we'll talk about investing uh, next week, but this is just you know, a little idea that I'm tossing out there. Um, the other thing is profit motives are taking precedence over life. I mean, if you have to, if you're a board of director of a large corporation, you are uh, by law constrained to pursue the maximization of the profit for your shareholders. So whether that has to do with, you know, think about the Bhopal disaster it was really based on a lax maintenance uh, a procedure of, of uh, um, what, what was the company? Union. Union Carbide, exactly. I mean, that was based on uh, a desire to cut corners and reduce cost and, and improve profitability. Profitability became more important than, um, than life. By the way, all this presentation is available to you. So you're welcome to take pictures, but you can get the whole thing. And I think Thomas has the uh, PDFs. The other thing is I have a mailing list here. So if you want to add your name to my mailing list, I can let you know about other uh, times when I speak and um, so on. So uh, what else? Reliance on market. So if you rely on market for everything, like we have a market-based system for healthcare provisioning in this country. I had just a little uh, uh, story to tell you. I was in Italy this summer, and I had a little problem with something in my skin that looked like chicken pox. It was not, but you know, it looked a little bit scaly. So I went through a battery of tests there, and I no longer am part of the healthcare system in Italy, because I've been living here for 29 years. So I went to a private clinic and paid out of pocket. And the whole barrage of tests they did cost me 36 euros, 36, which is 30, you know, $39. Uh, and they had itemized things, like uh, you know, the drawing of blood was two euros and 10 cents, you know, like $2.50, right? This is because there also was a national system that kept those guys honest in terms of pricing. Then I went here, I did my you know, annual checks, and I had to pay $700 for it. It's like the same, the same type of test. There was nothing special about it. You know, it says, one, when you use a market system to deliver basic services, that's the problem you uh, are encountering. Now, the other thing is the markets don't see certain things. Like, no one has to pay for pollution unless there, there is regulation that makes them pay, right? Uh, people don't have to pay for taking down the forest. You know, nature does not charge us. So, the reliance on markets leads to the exploitation of what, what are called externalities, which is costs that somebody else has to pay for. So when we have, for example, the pollution of all the um, you know, chemical inputs that are flowing down the Mississippi River and destroying you know, the, the Gulf of Mexico, that cost is borne by somebody else, maybe the fishermen there, maybe the people that uh, you know, would like to invite tourists uh, to the beach. and you know. They can't because now the, the place is fouled up. So, um, what else? 
there is an internal contradiction of labor as cost versus labor income as aggregate demand. Let me explain. If you, have, if you are a business, the less you pay your workers and the better off you are because your costs are lower, labor costs are lower, and you are better positioned to compete with other businesses that might be paying their workers a little bit more or maybe a fair wage. But if everybody does that, then the aggregate income in the economy, which is what the workers receive, also comes down. And that is really what drives economic activity. It's like if everybody is being paid less, there is less money circulating in the economy, and you also have to cut down on production and things like that. You know, uh, Ford, the, the guy who was making the cars, understood that and said, I want to pay my workers enough for them to buy my cars. And, but, uh, you know, the aggregate level is the same thing. What is logical and rational from the point of view of an individual firm, which is pay as little as possible for labor, is actually damaging to the economy as a whole, including that business. And in fact, they found out that when minimum wages have gone up, you know, there are, for example, in, in uh, um, Australia now, the minimum wage is about $15. I think in Denmark it's about 22 When they did that, uh, you know, overall the economy has not suffered. The jobs have not uh, disappeared because yes, they might disappear from some really marginal businesses that you know could only make it because they are subsidized by substandard wages. But then the additional amount of of money in the economy allows other businesses to expand and other businesses to be created. Uh, and finally, the decision makers are insulated from the impact of their decisions. And remember that chart that we saw at the beginning. Uh, there's an interesting book uh, by Jared Diamond called Collapse. And he studied the uh, societies that collapsed in the past and found out that the key variable was whether the elite of the society was separated from the impact of their decision. And right now we're in a situation where the people that have the decision maker and the people that have a lot of wealth, a lot of power, are insulating themselves in uh, you know, whether buying land in you know, New Zealand or living in gated communities and so on. And that is a problematic uh, thing for us. Um, so, let's think about a new economic system. Now that you think about those as the key design flaws, then you can say, okay, if we structure a new economic system that does not have these problems, right? How, how do we do that? How do we think about it? Uh, and in fact, I was planning to have you come up with the problems with capitalism, but I forgot. So <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll take another break and do something else. Um, so what would an alternative economic system look like? We need to think about these dimensions. And as I said, I don't have the solutions, but we all need to think in terms of these dimensions. One is, what about human needs and labor? How do we treat that? Right? Uh, how do we satisfy basic human needs and how do we treat labor not as a commodity because if you do, the more productive you are and the fewer people you need and then you have really massive unemployment out there. Uh, what is the role of the private sector? Of course, you know, we can't have a command and control economy. I would say I was in Cuba uh, in January and they have pretty much a command economy for 80% of the economy. And yes, they can deliver health care and education and basic food to everybody. There's, there are no homeless people, there are no you know, hungry people right now, but the economy is not doing very well. And, and there are a lot of tensions and problems there, and they're trying to migrate from a situation where 80% of the economic activity is dictated by the government to one where the private sector uh, can do more. But they're doing now by, very interesting, trying to expand um, worker-owned cooperatives, meaning if you have a private entity, at least need to be one that is run democratically, where the people that are involved make the decisions collectively. Uh, what is the role of the public uh, and non-profit sector in this new economy? Uh, what about nature and property rights? I mean, this is a big one, because right now we're saying, if you own a lake and a forest, with that ownership comes the right to destroy it if you want it. 
Now you can destroy someone else's lake, right? But the lake itself has no right to exist. And it's kind of weird if you think about that, that a working ecosystem that has been developed over millennia, it's providing key ecosystem services not only to the current generation of humans, but to you know, millions of species and to future generation of humans, right? Can be destroyed by the single owner of that plot of land. You know, it's like, wh what are we thinking about? And so how do we uh, limit, for example, the rights associated with the uh, uh, private property of working ecosystems that are providing ecosystem services for future generations? That's something that we need to think about. These are you know, big questions in America, but uh, we need to think about that. What is the role of the market? If the market does not see certain things, in which situation does it make sense to have market forces, which one not? I mean, I saw the situation, for example, I don't know if you saw uh, recently in the New York Times, this uh, young 30-year-old hedge fund manager bought a pharmaceutical company and jacked up the prices of um, you know, this drug that is really essential for, you know, um, I think it's a parasitic uh, infestation that happens with AIDS, you know, by 700%. It's like, wait a second, how, how does that work? You can't say, oh, it's needed for research. You've done zero research. Just bought this other company and checked out the price. So, uh, you know, again, uh, what is the role of the market? But from a strictly market standpoint, that was a brilliant move. You know, now more people will die, and the people that can afford can maybe survive that, that parasitic infestation. But is that the way we want to run the economy, really? Um, and I think the direction we need to move towards is decentralization. We need to think about size and decision. So, let's talk about human needs and labor. In fact, I'll let you talk among yourself about that for a couple of minutes. <laughs> Wasn't that fun? I don't know why I'm talking to you guys. I should just let you rip. And I bet there are so many interesting ideas. So, um, here I'm just uh, giving you some uh, thinking uh, around those points. I bet you have even better ideas than I have, and that's really what it's all about. It's like there are no experts here, right? We really have to come up with a better way of running our society. And it's up to society, which is you and me, but there isn't really a hierarchy here, and that's the key. So let me just run you through some ideas and see how many of you kind of resonated with, the, with them. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So that will be kind of a fun thing to do afterwards because I don't want to talk for two hours. So in terms of human needs and labor, if we're really saying that everybody should have their fundamental um, needs met, then one way to do that is with a basic income. And if you think about how productive our economy is, even though it's not at full capacity, and if you think about that increase in the productivity of labor to the point where you don't need that many people to work anymore, then it's logic to say, well, we generate enough to take care of everybody's basic needs. So uh, the interesting thing is some people have a uh, objection to this thought, saying people need to earn their thing. So we can talk about a different method, but just keep in mind that the Swiss are going to have a national referendum on a basic income of 2,700 euros a month for every citizen in Switzerland. That's probably going to happen this year. So in other words, it is a thought that now is occurring and should be entertained. I'm not saying that we should do that. But if you think about even something as basic as $1,000 a month for everybody, you eliminate the 47 people that are food insecure, you're probably eliminating most of homelessness because you can have a couple of people come together and rent a little place somewhere. Therefore, reducing the cost of uh, you know, SNAP, the SNAP program, the, you know, we, we already providing to a certain extent, a basic income. We're just doing it in little patchworks and some people get it, some people forget to claim it and so on. You know, but just uh, think about a way to rationalize that. 
if we're really serious about meeting everybody's fundamental human needs. The other one is labor productivity and free time. In the 60s, as economists were looking at the increased productivity of labor, they were saying the problem we would have in the year 2000 is how do we use all our free time? <laughs> now, how much free time <laughs> do you guys have if you're still working and trying to pay the bills, right? We, zero, people have like two, three jobs, they're juggling, you know, family obligations and labor. I mean, what happened to all that productivity? Well, the answer is it all got to pay for capital and all got into corporate profits. So in other words, that big discrepancy between how much we, we have been paying labor and how much labor has produced is something that we could have arranged in a different way so that one of the choices would be to pay labor more and allow them to have more free time. For the people that are saying, it's unfair that people just get something for free. You know, uh, if, let, let them work. Well, there are a lot of people that would like to work and can find a job, so another idea is to have the government be the employer of last resort. You want to work, you can't find it in the private sector, the government will provide it. And we've done that during the WPA uh, in the 30s. Uh, the government employed 12.5 million people and built parks and built post offices and dams and roads and so on. So in other words, if you, uh, the other thing you need to keep in mind, and this might come a little bit as a surprise to you, unemployment is actually a policy choice. This is from the Federal uh, Open Market Committee, um, came out in November 16, 1999, and I'll read because you probably won't be able to see it. Uh, the pool of available workers willing to take jobs has been drawn down farther in recent months. So this was a period of economic expansion. A trend that must eventually be contained if inflationary imbalances are to remain in check and economic expansion continue. In other words, it is a policy decision to have a certain amount of unemployment in our country. And that's mostly because it keeps uh, wages really low and therefore profits of corporations high. So it's really a policy lever. So one idea is to have a so-called buffer stock, not of unemployed people, where we're trying to keep at least a certain amount of unemployed people around, but a buffer stock for employment provided by the government. In other words, right now we have government jobs, private sector jobs, and the unemployed. Let's replace the unemployed with a job guarantee program that puts everybody to work and communities could be involved in deciding, you know, where does the help, uh, where, where does the help, uh, is the help needed most? Is it for childcare? Is it, is it for fixing parks? Is it uh, fixing our infrastructure? And the government will provide for that. And obviously when the economy recovers and there is more demand for that, that is a buffer stock that can go down and more people are then reabsorbed into the private sector. There is no reason why we should have unemployed people, people that want to work and cannot find it. It is a policy and we can address that. By the way, if you have a basic unemployment program, that also puts a floor on the price of labor. Because whatever the government pays for that uh, job guarantee program, that is effectively the minimum wage. No one else would accept a job uh, in the private sector for less than what they can get from a guarantee program. So that's one way to, you know, put a floor on that commodity, which is labor. Because the natural tendency would be to go all the way to slavery, where people just work for what the minimum amount that would support them. Uh, you know, public works program, you've probably heard that our infrastructure is really weak. Uh, we have 70,000 structurally deficient bridges. There is a lot of work to do. Um, I want to talk about the Marcora law in Italy. Marcora was a uh, liberal secretary in, liberal minister in Italy in 1984. 
And he said, why don't we provide the unemployed people another option? We have unemployment benefits for two years. We can say, okay, you have a choice. Either keep looking for a job, and if you don't find it, we'll pay you unemployment benefits for two years, or get together with nine other people in your same situation, start a worker-owned cooperative, and the government will provide you the entire two years of unemployment benefit as a startup capital for your enterprise. We'll also provide technical assistance so that you have a chance to succeed. But if you don't succeed, you're done with unemployment benefits, right? So isn't that an interesting model? In a region called Emilia Romagna, 45% of the GDP of that region is produced by worker-owned cooperatives. You know, and, and that's a great stabilizer in the economy when you have local um, you know, economic activity directed by the people that live in the community themselves. Uh, you probably heard about the Mondragon Cooperative. I don't have um, time to get into that, but if there are Q&A, we can talk about it. This is basically what started in 1956, now has more than 200 cooperatives that are kind of linked to the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, which is an umbrella organization that provides technical assistance, helps uh, you know, cooperatives that are in trouble, and has a fund. So 10% of the profits of all the cooperatives that are part of the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation uh, go to it to fund other new startup cooperatives. And now they employ about um, 80,000 people. They have about $30 billion worth of um, gross um, sales worldwide. And actually, even a, a more sophisticated model of that is the Cleveland model here in the United States. We're actually involving uh, anchor institutions like hospital and universities um, to commit to use some of their procurement dollars to buy services for industrial size worker-owned cooperatives that would provide uh, the services to these large institutions. And in that case, you actually have the community also and these large institutions being part of a network of governance and uh, funding of those worker on cooperatives. Um, so uh, if you haven't seen the, the documentary, The Shift, it's a great one to, uh, to watch about the um, Cleveland model. So just in terms of decision making and ownership, I just want to contrast and I'm not saying that worker-owned co cooperatives are the solution to everything. There are certain things that are hard to do. Um, you know, if we do, like, uh, think about the difference between an oil company run a, as a worker-owned cooperative and, you know, a garbage collection uh, company. I mean, the, the power relations there are very uh, different. The issue of scale, can you really do you know, an airplane manufacturer that is run as a cooperative, you know. So there are a lot of issues, but nevertheless, if you think in terms of decision-making and ownership, this is the typical situation in a large corporation. You have a lot of shareholders. Think about Apple. Some of you might actually own some shares of Apple. Guess what? You are not a major shareholder. And I'm, there might be some, someone here that are major shareholders, but uh, you know who you are. <laughs> but uh, the decision makers are really, you know, there is some, uh, some overlap obviously between workers and shareholders because the workers through 401k plants, you know, the, uh, whatever, they, or just by buying the, the shares in the market, they might uh, own some. But the reality is that the, the key decision makers are the board of directors and the CEO and the executives, the, that the board of directors are usually selected by the major shareholders. And uh, the board of directors uh, fires and hires the CEO. So out of all these people that theoretically own the company and work in the company, the decision makers are just a very few. Now, the relationship is this, right? Major shareholders select the board of directors, hires or fires uh, CEO and chief executive. Now, in a worker-owned cooperative, the owners are the workers themselves. And yes, the board might actually be uh, comprising some people that are outside the worker cooperative, possibly, but the CEO and the executive are workers and owners. And in this case, the decision-making flow is completely different. The workers are selecting the board of directors, and the board of directors hires or fires the CEO and executives. So let's look at the difference in decision-making 
of a typical large corporation and a worker-owned cooperative. So right now, in the United States, the ratio of CEO pay to the average worker is 380 to 1. Now that number changes between 200 and 400 depending on you know, how you slice it and dice it. But think about McNamara when he was the uh, uh, CEO of Ford, I think before he became the Secretary of Defense in the United States, so in the 60s, um, he was making seven times the average uh, salary of the people working at Ford. So it was 7 to 1 then. It's now 300, 400 to 1. Why? Because the compensation is decided by the board of directors or um, subcommittees thereof. And they're all made of other people that are CEOs or big dudes in other corporations. Now, what about the allocation of profits? Uh, the interesting thing is that, for example, in the Mondragon Cooperative, the uh, ratio of CEO to the lowest per, uh, person, paid person is 6 to 1 right now. And these are some fairly large industrial corporations. You know, they have um, uh, research companies, they have universities, they have uh, re um, you know, retail uh, chains, and so on. The other one is, what about the allocation of profits? Right now the profits are allocated, um, you know, they could go to dividends, they could um, sit in the books of the corporations, there are actually a lot of cash, some estimates is three trillion dollars worth of cash sitting on the books of um, various corporations right now, they're not allocated. Uh, you could allocate it to buy some elections, for example, or buy some regulators, or buy a president or two. Um, you know, that's one way of allocating the profits of larger corporations. Now, in the case of the Mondragon Cooperative, for example, they have the following structure. 10% of the profits go to the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation that helps, you know, start other cooperatives. 45% is invested in uh, the business itself. So to improve processes, improve machineries, and so on. And 45% goes to the retirement fund of the workers. That's how they decided to allocate the profits. Now, what about the use of toxic material, unsafe working condition, moving the factory to China? Now, you can think that worker-owned cooperatives would probably make completely different decisions, right? There are very large multinational corporations where the decision makers are not even around where the stuff is made or, or built or even shipped. So uh, I'm going to skip that, uh, but let's think about the role of the public and the nonprofit sector now. Now the interesting thing is that somebody that works for the public or the nonprofit sector, uh, their labor is not necessarily a commodity, if you think about that, right? And that's in part the reason why some um, uh, government employees are paid better than uh, workers in the private sector. You know, they have better benefits and so on. It's, it's not, you know, the um, labor that works for government or a government entity or even a uh, non-for-profit is not exactly treated as a commodity. Not as much as it is in the uh, private sector. Now, maybe we should think of the public and the non-profit sector uh, as owners and stewards of the common for current and future generations. That's one idea. It's like if we have all this productive uh, ecosystems in this country. Uh, think about farmland and the fact that more than 50% of it will change hands in the next 20 years because the farmers right now are really uh, aging. Uh, I think the average age of farmers now is 59 or 60 years old or might be even higher right now uh, because farming is really hard. That land will change hand and it might go to foreign investors that are just buying land. I know a situation where a very large tract of land in California um, was, um, there was a bid by one of the Arab states to buy it and grow alfalfa for their horses. So there, I mean, it's like when foreign capital comes in, buys a piece of productive land, that could actually be taken out of production of food for the local population. China was entering into long-term leases with Madagascar, I think, to uh, control 90% of their uh, agricultural land. And there was a little bit of a revolt there. Anyhow, but that's one idea. Now, the interesting thing is uh, we talked about money and banking uh, last month. And remember, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet expanded from $800 billion 
to four and a half trillion dollars between 2007 and now. It's a huge expansion. They did that, this is just the assets of the balance sheet here. In 2007 they were holding mostly treasury bills and some other assets. Now they hold treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Well, the amount of the increase in the balance sheet of the Fed. Remember, when the, when the Fed buys something, just creates the money to buy it. Right? That's, that's the one amazing trick of the Federal Reserve, is that their liability is the ultimate money in our system. When they buy something, they create the money to buy it. And there is no limit as to how much they can do so. Well, the total expansion is greater than the total amount of U.S. student debt and the total value of U.S. farmland just in terms of perspectives. So, you know, I'm not advocating, but one possible idea would be, what if the Federal Reserve swaps some of this for the land that becomes available when it's being sold and holds it in perpetuity, uh, mandating certain, um, you know, criteria for environmental stewardship so that we could have, you know, young farmers do organic farming on that land and since we're there, why doesn't buy also all the student debt and just forgives it? Uh, these are like crazy idea, but we are entering crazy times. And we really need to look at all the options. So I would say looking at the balance sheet of the Fed as a way of managing our natural commons is something that needs to be considered. Um, so. We talked about government uh, as the employer of last resort. I mean, it's like unemployment is a policy. We should have a policy of employing everybody who want to work, period. Uh, public works program. Another thing that we probably need to do, and this is something that was proposed by, um, um, what's his name, Simon, C. Simon. Henry C. Simon was the founder of the Chicago School of Economics. Very conservative school. He was the teacher of Milton Friedman. And he was saying when companies become so big that you cannot regulate them and the uh, competitive landscape is completely distorted by them, you need to nationalize them. This guy was a free market guy that basically recognized you don't have a free market when you have really big entities that are writing the rules for how everybody plays the game. And so the idea is to run, nationalize, and run as a nonprofit key infrastructure pieces, whether these are physical or social. For example, banking, for example, healthcare, for example, education. That's an idea to you know, float out there. Uh, as a possibility. When the uh, uh, banks collapsed in 2007, effectively the government could have just bought them out. It did, almost. Uh, you know, injected so much money into those, uh, those banks and they were worth very little. And that's the way, you know, Sweden dealt with the problem of their banking crisis in the late 90s. They actually nationalized all the banks, cleaned them up, broken up, and sold them again. Why not, maybe, keep some of them uh, as key pieces of infrastructure? Uh, nature and property rights. Again, if an actual system is an endowment for present and future generations, then uh, private property should not allow you to just destroy it. And so, you know, how do we put, and these are some ideas, obviously. Uh, one is have land trusts and land stewardship models that hold productive ecological um, ecosystems. Restriction of property rights of land and ecosystems. They say, okay, you want private property for a piece of land or a forest? You cannot destroy that. You need to maintain its uh, function as an ecosystem. And then you, know, you can have, I don't know, ecotourism or maybe farming with, with right practices. These are just ideas. And again, um, we need to have a discussion on, on all these topics. Um, one other trend now is rights of nature. So, you know, how do you protect nature? Uh, well, you imbue it with rights. Uh, there, is, uh, there are a couple of groups that are doing that in the United States, a couple of nations that imbue that into the Constitution. Um, Ecuador and Bolivia have done so. It's a way of saying, well, nature should have a right to exist and flourish. Now, some people would say, it's a silly idea. You know, why do we give nature the rights? Nature is maybe sacred. 
Maybe it's something that we need to regard in a different way, but this might be a strategy to save it before it gets completely destroyed. Um, and again, nature as sacred is maybe the ultimate step, which, by the way, the Native Americans had. Um, and I'm really excited to see our Pope uh, speak in those terms. So the role of markets. Now we have a market for goods and services. I think that's pretty good. Should we have a market for financial capital? That's a big one. Like, if all the wealth is concentrated in the hands of one, two, three percent of the world population, and that capital can go wherever it wants and do whatever it wants whenever it wants, can we really have democracy? Can we really have sustainability? That's a big conversation we need to have. And I know this is like something that makes people a little bit uh, nervous, but the problems we're facing are really large. And we need to have some bold thinking about it. That's why I love the idea of slow money and local investing, where at least the capital is used locally. It does not you know, yank away when it wants to do something else and leaves people stranded in, in its wake. Uh, what about the labor market? Shall that, sh should we have a labor market? Or you know, what limits do we put in, in that labor so that we don't have a commodity that could fall to zero when we have too many people out there looking for, for jobs? Uh, again, use an allocation of natural resources based on the carrying capacity and renewal rates. Maybe we should have some limit and say, the only thing we can take out of aquifers is what can be replenished. Whatever we can take out of forest is what can regrow. You know, so have a limit on the carrying capacity of those systems. And in general, I think the direction we need to move towards is decentralization, and then we need to think about size and decision making. So I don't want to um, belabor this point, but I think we're already decentralizing energy production, food production, provision of physical, uh, uh, physical goods. We certainly need to dismantle and nationalize the too big to fail and too big, big for healthy competition, whether those are banks or other you know, media conglomerates or whatever it is. Um, and again, communities and ecosystems affected by economic financial decisions need to be at the table. So uh, at the end of the day, it's your turn to think about these dimensions. I'm just presenting you with what are the uh, you know, key design problems of the current system, what are the categories that we need to tackle, and it's really up to you to figure out how to do it, and then change the world. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to, I'm gonna pass this thing around. If you want, uh, I, I don't have that list, so um, if you want to add your name to my mailing list, uh, I can let you know once a month what, what it's up to and articles and things like that. And so let me know if you want to do that. And I would open up for questions. Thank you, Marco. Uh, how about a big hand for what's happened already? <laughs> oh, by the way, we have a, an essential reading list here for people interested. Uh, w would you please line up for questions uh, uh, behind the microphone and uh, yeah and that's really all there is just try to make questions rather than speeches we're, we're all on board for that right uh -huh. <laughs> uh, hi so money is still a mystery to me and I was really I so I, my questions are around when you mentioned how the value of nature and what's contributed and um, can you speak more to how productivity is measured or how that type of valuation is measured because like for me um, so like last week my light switch broke and so I went to the um, to the hardware store and bought a new light switch and I was just really amazed that I could buy this light switch for 88 cents and, you know and all the materials that go into it it just seemed to me like oh how did they decide that this thing costs 88 cents when I you know I could just imagine all the resources that went into making this light switch um, and and similarly how is can you point me toward resources for understanding how productivity is measured, um, you know, how, especially in our economy today when there's so much that is uh, services rather than physical goods and, and how we measure that, you know, or the, the, the value of like, you know, homemakers and so forth, like all that productivity, how is, how is that? A know? simple question yeah. that would <laughs> just require about uh, two days of, uh, you know, a seminar of two days. So first of all, a couple of things. Um, 
a lot of what is of value is not quantified in dollar terms. Mm -hmm. This is true not only for nature and the services it provides, but also the caring economy, right? I mean, the, the people staying at home taking care of the kids, of course, that's a value to society, but there isn't a, a measure mm -hmm. around that because the, the only thing we measure is what flows through the market. So we have a labor market, you know, people are, uh, you know, their time is bought and sold, and so we know what the price of that is. Now, when you're talking about the, the switch, and uh, um, what happens there is you, that's probably a dishonest price. It's a price that does not fully embody the environmental cost, the social cost uh, involved with that. Most of the stuff are made in China. They have very lax environmental regulation, and the conditions for a lot of the workers are, is really tough. Now, in terms of the productivity, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we know how many hours have been worked in this country, and we know what is the total value of goods and services being produced. So you divide one by the other, and then you find out what is the amount of goods and services produced by one hour of labor. So that's kind of, that includes also services. It's not just for the actual physical gizmos that we make. I don't know if that answers okay, your question. Okay, thank you. I have so many questions, but there was, there was one thing that you were talking about that made me think of a pair of articles I read this morning. Uh, both of the, these were talking about Uber. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, one of the articles is talking about uh, how all the Uber drivers tried to stage a protest this weekend by just not doing any Uber thing and, and just protesting the, the working conditions because they're being treated somewhat like slaves or something like that. Uh, and then the other was uh, some economics somebody or other uh, saying that uh, what Uber needs to do is to move into self-driving cars so that they don't have to have these pesky humans driving the cars around. Um, and you know there's there is this trend that uh, all the car companies are working on self-driving cars and and so in a very short time you know taxi drivers, bus drivers, all these other driver people are going to not have a job. <laughs> so good questions. Uh, and uh, first of all, having a driverless car eventually is another example of technology displacing mm -hmm. work, right? Yeah. So in fact, there, is, there was an article recently, I think it was in the Forbes magazine, saying the end of work, where you know, we might get to a place where machines and robots are doing all the work, and then what? I mean, if we attach um, you know, our ability to survive to our ability to sell our labor, and labor is no longer needed because the machines are doing everything for us, what are we going to do? Are we all going to you know, have a big chunk of the population just starve? Right? So, but your question is very important because it goes at the core of this idea of labor as a commodity and the problems you have when you have such a great productivity, including eventually maybe not needing an Uber driver anymore because the cars will drive themselves. Although, you know, again, we're probably quite a few years out of there. And the, the, the first rounds will be uh, assisted driving where the driver is still there and, and well, you know, able to take control. Okay, so but Tesla just uh, delivered assisted driving features to their cars a couple days ago. Right. Uh, you know, I, I track the news on, on car developments. So right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very aware that all of the car companies are, are working on self-driving cars and they're planning on, Great. So let's they're planning on a car sharing service where Absolutely. it's automated cars that deliver themselves to your door automatically right. with Great. no driver. Great. So let's assume that, that we're going to be there in five years or ten years. Yeah. We won't need another swat of people doing those jobs anymore, mm -hmm. right? And so what are we going to do with them? So again, if you don't have either a job guarantee program or a way of uh, distributing some of the wealth that is created by all this technology and all this automation, then you're going to have a lot of you know, starving people on, on the street. And that's, you know kind of makes my point. And in the case of Uber, uh, you're right. I mean, the, this idea, some people thought the sharing econo economy would be automatically good for everybody. And you know, the sharing in this case is the drivers are providing the car. Right, and so their car is being shared as a service because they are picking passengers, moving them, them around. But the reality is that who controls that economic activity is the 
uh, venture capital that uh, was invested in Uber and the people that are running Uber. Uh, and the workers in reality are not even workers, they're like freelancers that provide both the, uh, the service of driving things around and to drive their own car around. I mean, it's really fascinating. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but that is the crux of the matter, right? Uh, as more and more of the technology and the advancements will make more and more people obsolete, whether it's the, oper the phone operator, which now we would laugh at saying, you know, if we press zero and there's a little lady saying, oh, who would you like to talk to, right? I mean, we, we would find that ludicrous. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll find ludicrous the fact that somebody wants to be a taxi driver and drive people around when all the cars are self-driving. But the problem remains that as technology displaces more and more work, what do you do? How do you distribute the wealth that is generated by this economy that requires less and less people to keep going? Hi, i um, got a million questions. Um, well, first of all, just real directly, um, could you explain, I think last week you were focusing on- Money your, banking. Get your, yeah, banking, get your money out of banks, get them into a credit union, local banks, right? Right. So explain, for some reason it's not coming through to me. If you had a big mortgage with one of the big four, okay, and you switched it to a credit union, is that like a, a really good thing to do or is it just like whack-a-mole, the problem pops up somewhere else? Well, uh, no, actually, it's better for a couple of reasons. Um, the fact that we have four banks that control 50% of our deposits and 50% of the banking assets in this country, that represents a systemic risk to our economy. And if something goes wrong with those entities, the government will be on the hook to bail them out again, or we as taxpayers. Yeah. So the process of you moving business from the four large banks to a smaller regional bank or credit union is helping reduce the systemic risk. So that's one thing. The other one is a credit union is a non-profit entity run for the interest of its members. It's technically democratically run because you as a member of the credit union could run for the board. Uh, and the other thing is if they have extra profits, they're actually redistributed in lower interests for the loans they make or higher interests for the depositors. So one thing you're doing is that you're capturing more of the, the money by having uh, it in a credit union because instead of paying uh, outlandish bonuses to the top guys, you're going to see better rates in your uh, savings account or your deposits or lower mortgage rates. So that's basically the advantage to you of moving the money to a credit union. But the other one is, think about the systemic effect. If more people were to do that, we could resize the large banks just by our own individual uh, uh, decisions. Can, sorry, I was going to ask one more, but there's a lot of you. Um, two innovations that have already been put into our legal system and had probably just minor effects so far I'd like you to comment on. One is um, the word shareholder is trying to be replaced with the word stakeholders and already certain legal battles have uh, taken place where nature is a stakeholder and future generations are a stakeholder that the judicial system has to consider in making its decision. Another innovation is that the current corporate laws, when you incorporate, you have to choose a corporate legal structure to incorporate within. Most likely uh, model has been to put profit as your sole obligation on the board of directors. Uh, now there's <laughs> alternative corporate structures where you can allow the board of directors and in fact insist that the board of directors evaluate a, a range of values, not just profit. Can you just comment on these two innovations? Please? Oh, absolutely. So thank you for mentioning that because that was the, the one slide I skipped. Uh, there was a slide that had a very, um, a lot of uh, color. I don't know if I get there, but uh, I will eventually. So um, the C corporation is the most common uh, corporation right now, legal structure for uh, companies that sell shares to shareholders. And according to, if you're the board director of a C corporation, y your only goal is to maximize shareholders' profit. profit. 
This was the problem with the Ben and Jerry's. They had to sell to Unilever, even though they received a lower offer from a company that would have kept their social mission and uh, the social expenditure that Ben and Jerry had to hire, uh, for example, youth at risk and so on, right? And so because of that, they introduced in a number of states new legal structure called benefit corporation. California has the benefit corporation structure, and so have at least 15 other states in the United States, including Delaware, by the way. So when you incorporate as a benefit corporation, you're saying that you're a for-profit, but not only for-profit company, and that you are also trying to address either environmental or social issue, so that shareholders cannot sue the board for making decisions that are not profit maximizing when they are taking care of the other planks in the DNA of the company. So that is a huge thing. It started with the B Lab certification, the, the B Corporation certification, which was a way of you know, getting companies, whether they were a C structure or an LLC, to have some bylaws to the effect that, as you said, there are other stakeholders in the community. Uh, and, but this is actually the legal structure, and so this embeds in the DNA of a corporation. So I'm very much in favor of benefit corporations, um, uh, B-Lab certification, and so on. So that's a great innovation, and I hope that all corporations yes. eventually will be benefit corporations. Yeah. Yeah. And we could begin lobbying C corporations. Lobbying, support them. Uh, yeah. you know, that's why you know, I, I'm not invested in any C corporation. You know, all my investments are direct investments or, or companies that, uh, you know, have other goals but uh, maximizing profit. Profit, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is, is this the same question as that fellow about three before me that, what, well, I, I know the guy, oh, he's from Italy, the guy who wrote the book, uh, The Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Oh, Federico Pistono? Uh, I do not know him. Oh. But uh, the, but next, uh, the next session will be delivered by a robot. So I hope, yeah. <laughs> I hope you all come here because you know, there will be a robot talking to you for uh, two hours. Yeah, and he's, he's posted several videos while on his website and Facebook, Google+, all those places. They did this thing in India where... Uh, Everybody there got their income, and, and well, he said, well, in his that video, um, but then a lot of them, well, they went and d did more work. I guess that would, would that be volunteer work? Well, except for thing, well, like, well, maybe a lot of the little boys maybe quit working because what they 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 went to school then and they couldn't before, and the little little girls would too, right. So but, again, uh, the idea that um, te technology. Is there a question there somewhere? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I'm I'm drawing a question out of your comment, if okay. I may. Um, so the idea is that technology does not necessarily need to be bad, mm -hmm. right? The fact that we can do more with less labor, yeah. it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if I'm replaced by a uh, by a robot giving the stocks, and I can just be home and garden, but still make a living, I will be fine, mm -hmm. right? The other thing is um, the, the idea, for example, of this uh, you know, basic income for everybody, and again, it has been tried in various parts. Uh, Argentina did that for a while, and what happened that was very interesting. A number of people were employed by uh, in, in jobs paid by the government but directed by the community for whatever the community needed. That program lasted just one administration and they had a really high turnover of presidents for a while. So after six, seven months, it was discontinued. Most of the people kept going to the job even though they were not paid anymore. So the idea that if you pay people, then they will be smoking pot and doing nothing all day long, uh, I don't quite buy it. I think people want really to contribute and be part of society and just have the basic needs met would allow kids to go to school when they maybe have to work in India and you know moms to stay at home with their kid as they should be, right? So um, anyhow, but. I'd like your comment on what I see uh, is both instructive and 
very worrisome about the current situation in the Bay Area. In the old days, it used to be parts of cities were gentrified. Now we've got not only a whole city, but almost the whole region becoming gentrified. And the public, the people, who, mostly, particularly in terms of housing prices, mm -hmm. and the, you know, there are large corporations that own the, the, a lot of the rental units, and they are very happy to, uh, to raise their rents. But there's many, many small you know, people who own one or two houses, and they're generally very happy to jump on the bandwagon, too, and, and double the rents they, they, they're able to get if, if they can. And this, I think, shows the, the, the challenge of really d changing capitalism because it's, it's like the, uh, it's the seduction of capitalism. That, that you can, you know, you can get on the, if, some, if you get on the bandwagon, you can make a lot of money and you can buy a lot of things and you can accumulate a lot of stuff. And I totally agree with your analysis, but it seems to me that so many people are seduced either by what they have now or what they think they can get that they're unwilling to really consider changing the structure. Right. That is a very good point. And it, what, it turns out that psychologists recognize that we have two different frames uh, in our uh, psyche. One is the self-regarding frame, and the other one is the compassionate, empathic, collaborative frame. Right. And so depending on what system you're put into, one gets activated versus the other. So if you are working in, uh, you know, in nature and have, as I said, a community garden, you tend to be really generous you know, because there is such an abundance. You know, nature is set up in a way that is really generous and abundant and, and basically highlights the part of our brain that has to do with compassion, sharing, and so on. But there's also another part of us which has to be recognized, which is the self-regarding you know, this is mine, I'm going to get ahead of you. In fact, they found that sometimes the happiness is being just a little bit above everybody else. So you're, you know, people are happier if they were saying, would you rather make 50,000 when everybody else makes 100,000? Or would you rather make 40,000 when everybody else makes 20,000 around you? <laughs> a lot of people prefer the 40,000 when everybody makes 20,000, <laughs> right, right. right? So, you know, there is that thing that, you know, we feel better when we're a little bit ahead of the curve or of our neighbors. So we need to recognize there are those two structures in our psyche. And depending on where you're embedded in terms of the system, one versus the other is activated. And so capitalism is perfect for the self-regarding part. But that forgets about the fact that we're all connected, really, both economically, right. uh, in terms of our basic needs, right. in terms of air, water, and so on, right. and that we need to shift and think about systems that activate the other part of us. And you know, in terms of the gentrification, it has to do with the fact that we have some mega corporations mm -hmm. that create a lot of value, uh, according to you know, the way society has uh, uh, defined value, like Google, Facebook, Apple, and so on. And so their attractive, tremendous wealth into this region can pay a lot of people really good salaries, right. and that is gentrifying the whole, yeah. Um, yeah. The whole area. So. Okay, thanks. Hi. So um, there's, a, there's a lot in it, and one piece is how to organize and display. Well, before I get there, the the thing that you just said about the two sides of the psyche, um, that's also, the, all the major religions were founded by teachers who were trying to teach people how to leave the negative one and go to the positive right. one. So that's why all religions are branches of the same tree. So there, if we do that kind of thinking, there's probably a lot of things that could be displayed as a, as a map of a way to get from here to there. and. If, and if they're put in those terms, then the people who identify with being compassionate could also, oh, that's how we do this. So are you working on, that's a good map, are you working on, there's other pieces of that map that could be put together. Are you having a group of people doing that, or are you looking for a group of people to do that? Right, so there's a whole part of the talk that I kind of skipped, which is what can you do? So in other words, uh, support the nascent um, elements that are aligned with the new system. Yeah, I'm talking about the strategic part 
of actually setting up a, an, a meta picture that people can, oh, that's where I fit and that's how I can do this. I believe that the meta picture has to uh, emerge from collective discussions. You know, it's like, I don't believe that I can come up with a big plan or say, that's where we're going to go, people follow me. It's really, you know, has to, the new system, the way we get to the new system has to embody the principle of the system we seek. And if we're saying that where we need to move towards is a place where the people that are affected by decisions are at the, at the table deciding, that means all of you need to be participating in figuring out how to do this. You know, I'm just highlighting some of the dimensions and some of the topics we need to figure out, but it's really up to all of us to do that. But I would say support right now already the things that are uh, in vain with that. So for example, um, you know, go to restaurants that pay their workers enough. You know, ask the waitress whether they can, uh, you know, are they paid a living wage or do you uh, rely on tips to, to make ends meet? And go to the restaurants that are paying decent wages. Uh, trying to shop at cooperatives and, and worker owned cooperatives or, you know, companies that are doing, participating in the life of the community in various ways, right? So, I mean, there is a lot that we can do to, to cultivate the state of mind that would make us more comfortable in the new system as opposed to the old system. Yeah, but well, we can also, there are also those of us who are actually doing a strategy too. Great. Who, who could so, come together? Mark, we don't wonderful. Uh, thanks, Marco, uh, for bringing that up. By the way, ROC United has an app. You can find it, ROC, and that app will tell you which restaurants are paying fair wages. Uh, nice. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, last time, Marco, you talked about how the big banks took our illiquid assets, our mortgages, and chopped them up into derivative products and CDOs and so forth. And from my perspective, part of my visualization of that new economy that we're talking about would be where we put a less value on all this international speculation kind of activity and more value on the kind of activities you've touched on a couple of times, you know, caregivers, teachers. I just wondered if there was anything else you wanted to say about that. How would that rebalanced value of work look like? Well, you know, I'm a refugee of finance, right? So I was part of that world, and I'll explain that next week. Um, and again, making a really good salary and being part of the system, and it was a very glamorous job where I would travel around the world and things like that. And, uh, but at a certain point, you realize that uh, there is something missing on a deep sense, and there are a lot of people that at a certain point realize that their soul is really not being nourished by what they're doing. And I think we need to cultivate that ability to listen deeply to what we're called to do and see if it is aligned to what we're doing right now. And I think, uh, you know, both the yoga movement and the meditation uh, movement and, and Dharma practice and so on are really, or even, you know, coming to church like Unitarian Universalist and, and you know, be inspired to align really what you're doing, what you believe with your livelihood is very important. Um, so, I don't know if that answers the question, but it really has to be a revolution in consciousness and a revolution in, um, in really principles. Uh, you know, we really have to have a moral compass in all we do, and, and that's, that's that. We used to have that, and then, uh, you know, for a while, this crazy capitalist system said that the only thing you need to pay attention is how much money you make and that's where your worth and value is really. Uh, but, you know, we need to go back and say, no, we also need to have a moral compass that allows us to be citizens and be part of a, com a larger community, including the community of non-humans, in my view. So I, I can't uh, say thank you enough for what you've just last said about the moral compass. You mentioned Cuba, and um, in, with folks that I've heard, they say, hurry up and visit Cuba before it gets spoiled, before it gets changed. Now, the problems that Cuba had could have been exacerbated by the embargo. And so my question is just to th know what, 
effect you think that has. I mean, you really get spoiled just like our country is getting spoiled. That's one. And two is, have you seen an economic system anywhere in the world, in the globe, that really is uh, working for people? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, there is even a, a thought among some of the Cubans that the embargo is what uh, preserved their current socialist system for as long as it has. Because people were able to endure their hardship economically because the, they were being attacked by you know, us. And they said if, if they had lifted the embargo in the 60s, maybe now you know, Cuba would look like Florida. So now the question is, well, first of all, the embargo has not been lifted. Uh, and the travel bans has not been lifted either. So in other words, you can't just as a tourist go there. You can if you're a businessman now, or if you're going there for education purposes. You know, they, they've just uh, relaxed a few things. Like, for example, they've taken Cuba out of the list of uh, states sponsoring terrorism. Uh, and they uh, allowed you to bring back a little bit more money and allow some more res remittances to go in. And I think the, this will also change Cuba somewhat, but I think it will retain uh, its own character. You know, you have to keep in mind that they had to open their economy to foreign capital uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And there are a lot of um, uh, business relations with the Europe and Canada and so on right now. That is for a sector of the economy, mostly the one that has to do with uh, the tourism where you know the cooks are used which you know they have two currencies and you know it's a complicated story there but the interesting thing is that that is an example of a government by the way if you read some of the castro speeches way back when they didn't want to follow the russian uh, model either they wanted to have their own way of doing things uh, and the first thing they did is basically a literacy campaign that you know most of the population there was illiterate and within a year, they basically eradicated illiteracy. And they created schools, and they, you know, they're still providing health care and so on to their population, which is really spectacular if you think about the fact that we don't have that here. But again, the economy as a whole is really suffering because, uh, you know, in part of because of the embargo, in part because a command and control system for the economy is, is very difficult to maintain and manage. So, uh, but to answer your question, I, I don't know because I don't have a, a, a crystal ball, but I would say uh, the embargo has not been lifted yet. There are some businesses going in like Cargill and so on, which is a little bit worrisome. 50% uh, of all their agricultural land is laying fallow right now uh, in, in, uh, um, in Cuba. And so there are these large um, multinational agricultural companies that want to go in and farm there and so on, which is a little bit... Uh, you know, scary. But they're also, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's all a question of agreement. They have to negotiate. The, the government still negotiates what happens there, who comes in, you know, in, in what form. More, most of the international investments have been done as a, um, uh, is a partnership with the state. So it's, it's half, you know, controlled by the state and half by other entities. So I would say, if you have the occasion, go and visit. When I did, I realized, oh my goodness, our idea of Cuba and what it is, is probably the biggest discrepancy uh, of any other country. You need to go and visit if you haven't been there. The people are really amazing. So, um, I know we're, oh, we're past two, so we need to maybe yeah, take just, another couple of questions. Okay, um, well, one thing, you were talking about uh, the unemployment rate is a policy choice. And I read uh, Dean Baker's blog a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with Dean, no. the economist Dean Baker. Well, anyways, um, he points out that under Alan Greenspan, who can be criticized pretty heavily for not seeing a housing bubble that was right. as big as the sun, um, right. he forced unemployment down. He kept forcing it down below the 6%, which nobody wanted him to do, even though he was this like neoconservative Fed uh -huh. chair. So there really is evidence. It's a policy choice, and it's not necessarily inflationary. Uh -huh. Okay. The other thing, I don't feel that this question is really well thought out, but Baker points to what he thinks is a contradiction between the robots are going to take all of our jobs, uh -huh. which means there's a huge oversupply of labor right. on a macro level, and then you know individual capitalists saying, "My God, I can't get the help I need within an industry," and he's and Baker points out like, "Well, you can't have both these things going on uh -huh. at the same time." I don't know if you can. I mean, just people beware of that when you're reading opinion pieces. 
Right. And I don't know if you have any comments. Well, you know, that. what happens is that a lot of the jobs have gone from manufacturing to low paying jobs. I mean, we need a lot of uh, labor to do really menial work like uh, picking, you know, crops out of the field. You know, and for that, it's kind of hard to get enough labor because now there is this such an anti-immigrant uh, policy in the United States that not as many people are coming. And guess what? Not many Americans want to do those jobs. And so you have, for example, the agricultural sector that uh, have a hard time finding low-paying farm works that can come in and, and bring in the crops. Well, the follow-up I would have on that, though, is any like, large farmer who says, OK, there's a shortage, are the wages coming up? I mean, that's the evidence of a shortage if the, if the business people would offer higher wages. But you, you, see, you don't see that. Right. In part is because we have uh, some dishonest pricing in uh, uh, farming. So a lot of the commodity farmers are subsidized by the government. And so uh, some people that are not subsidized, they can't afford to pay more for labor because we have the subsidies in place. So it's a complicated story. But May we pause for a moment of appreciation before we rush out? Uh, in this morning's worship service here, a guest minister said, you know, when I think about how everything that we see came out of a speck of zero, infinite mass in zero space, I say, my Lord, that's amazing. And, and when you look at the sky and see a rainbow in the sky, you can say to yourself, say it with me, my good God, that's amazing. And when you hold a child in your arms, you can say, say it with me, my God, that's amazing. And when I find myself in the same room with someone who combines the scholarly rigor and the brilliant communication skills who can make these complex concepts available and accessible to all of us, I say to myself, my God, that's amazing. Well, thank, thank you, Michael. You.